Honestly, if you go type of ACS, I do that. I do that.
what my master's advisor thought genetics was. It's like, can't you just, he like had a wolf sample, like a piece of wolf meat, and he literally came into the office one day and was like, what can you tell me about this wolf? <laughs> yeah, I can run molecular analysis that tells us the sex, and that is a wolf. That's wolf, 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 whatever it is. That's one of my words I can't say, so I don't. And it's kind of funny because my husband wanted to name our son Wolfgang. Don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Wolfgang Brand, and I was like, that could go one of two ways. And I was like, I could know what would I call him. I can't call him wolf, but I'm there. So you're going to call him the name of the gang. Yeah, exactly. Gang of Gang of Brand? Yeah, that would work well. Very good. Yeah, so it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be totally different from the first half of the lab. So do we have different lab safety protocol now? I will, we'll go week by week and I'll sort of tell you. To be honest, we're not working with anything that's going to harm you. Unless you like bathe in it and you don't have enough money to afford enough of it to bathe in. So, okay, yes. Do we need lab goggles for the lab then? Or no? Mm -hmm. To be honest, I probably shouldn't say this on recording. I have. <laughs>
in the new chromosome, we have taken this E and F gene region, duplicated it, and so now we have two copies of E and two copies of F. So we are getting extra genetic material here. <coughs> And so in duplications, duplications normally occur during recombination. Okay. Remember that during a meiotic event or during meiosis, those tetrads or those homologous chromosomes line up next to each other. And we talked a little bit about during our meiosis lectures about how they line up. Does anybody remember how chromosome 1 finds chromosome 1 and lines up together? What is it based on? The central mirror location is part of it. The banding, which is a direct result of nucleotide sequence. Right? So if we have two copies of chromosome one, they're going to line up with all of the genes right next to each other. Okay, so, during, um, so these two chromosomes are misaligned. But if we shift this one over, A should line up with A, B to B, C to C, D to D. Right? They should line up perfectly. Because if we have crossing over occurring, we want to make sure that we exchange the exact amount of genetic material from one to the other. When they line up incorrectly, like these two have, we end up getting unequal crossing over. Okay? So these two, again, this one should be shifted over so that the the genes are lined up. When they cross over in the wrong place, what we end up with is one or two normal chromosomes, this one and this one, and then one that's really long because it has extra information, and one that's short because it has lost information. Okay. Now, the reason that they line up incorrectly is because, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons, but in our chromosome, so in our nucleotide sequence, we have what are called repetitive regions. They are regions that are very similar in sequence. Okay. So we have them sort of interspersed. The longer chromosome here, they're shown in red. So we have two regions that are very, very similar in sequence to each other. They just happen to line up incorrectly. Right. So this one and this one line up because they think that the sequence is the same, and they think that they're aligned correctly. So then when we get crossing over, this C and D get switched to this purple chromosome, and then D gets switched down to the blue chromosome, so we end up with one that's had a deletion and one that's had a, a duplication of that C gene. Do they always go together, duplication Not necessarily, but it, this would be a very common example. So when we're thinking about gamete formation from this, each of these chromosomes is going to go into a different gamete, presumably. So we would have one gamete that's normal, one gamete that has a duplication, one gamete that has a deletion, and then one more that's normal. So in these two, if they were fertilized and the uh, um, zygotes were viable, this individual would end up with a duplication, this individual would end up with a deletion. So these don't go together into one person. They're going to go into two different gametes. Um, okay. So in general, when we're thinking about the consequences of a duplication, it's kind of similar to the consequences of a deletion, where it really depends on which genes have been duplicated. Sometimes having an extra copy of a gene is no big deal. Sometimes making too much of a protein can be fatal. Um, generally, having more genes is better than having less genes, right? Because at least now you can still make the right amount of protein. Um, so there's not as many conditions or syndromes that are associated with extra gene copies as there are with lack of gene copies. If you don't have a gene, you can't make a protein. Here you can make a protein, you might make more. Um, so here's another example where we see crossing over occurring, and I think this is just one of those places I deleted things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So if I deleted things, you can just, it was excessive information that we didn't have to cover right now. 
Um, so here's an example where we have red and green eye coloration genes. Yes, red green color blindness, right? So this would be how red green color blindness occurs. In an individual, we should, so this would be two X chromosomes. The red gene and the green gene are very, very similar in sequence. They're 98% similar in their nucleotide sequence. So it is not necessarily super surprising that sometimes the red and green on homologous chromosomes accidentally line up. Right? So when they accidentally line up and we get crossing over occurring, we end up with some individuals that have two copies of the green gene. I, I don't know if that makes them more sensitive to green. Like, if they just have more receptors for that particular gene. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but then we have an individual that has no green receptor. Okay, so now they don't see that color at all. Okay. Now I'm imagining, my husband and I argue all the time about colors. Like he thinks something is orange and I think it's red or blue and purple or whatever. And so now I'm like envisioning that one of us has all these extra genes, alleles, <laughs> one of our color genes, and so we're just like hyper Yeah. All right. Um, Duplications do actually play a really important evolutionary purpose, okay? Um, and so we oftentimes have genes that duplicate themselves and stay inserted in our genomes. Oftentimes that second copy accumulates mutations, right? So we have one functional copy. We maintain that functional copy. It's important for us to produce blood cells. The other copy, we don't need. We don't need extra protein, so it can accumulate mutations that make it non-functional, or it can accumulate mutations that give it a different function. When that happens, we form what are called gene families. And so that's multiple genes that come from one original gene and have similar functions. So I put up here, this is a um, phylogenetic tree of toll-like receptor genes, which are genes that are involved in the immune system. They are all incredibly similar to each other in sequence because they all came from one original gene. But each of these different toll-like receptor genes identifies a different type of pathogen. Right? So TLR2 identifies a certain group of bacteria. TLR4 identifies a certain type of viruses, right? So they've evolved so that each one has its own function, but overall, the whole family still functions in the immune system, okay? So this is an important way that we sort of diversify particular functions within the body. Another one, another good example is our globin genes. So on a couple of chromosomes, we have a whole bunch of different globin, globin genes. They are, again, all similar in their origin, so they all came from one original globin ancestor, which has been duplicated, and then those duplicate genes have taken on other functions. Okay, so some of them are going to be involved in um, producing hemoglobin, some of them make myoglobin, um, some of them, uh, different globins are used during different developmental stages, so like the embryonic globin genes that we express are different from the globin genes that we express as adults, because we use oxygen differently. Okay. So again, these genes are, are important for carrying out, it basically gives us sort of redundancy and function, which allows us to ultimately function more efficiently. The last thing I want to mention about duplications is um, for some genes, it is very common for us to have duplicates. And again, it doesn't really necessarily impact phenotype a ton. Um, we call this copy number variation. And this is sort of a variation within a species. So in plants and animals, anywhere between 0.1 and 10% of the genome may show copy number variation. This would be an example 
of copy number variation where some individuals just have the standard two copies of a gene. Other individuals in that same population may have three copies because they have two copies on one chromosome. Um, this particular phenomenon has been linked to quite a few diseases and disorders at this point. So having additional copies of genes may increase susceptibility to certain conditions. And a few of them are listed up there. So something like schizophrenia, for a long time we've known that it is linked to, or there's like family, uh, there's inheritance of schizophrenia between family members. Right, so if your mom or grandma or aunts or uncles had schizophrenia, you become more likely to have it as well because there is a genetic component to it. We are now able to link it to how many copies of a particular gene. And that makes sense because if your mom had duplication or um, copy number variation, she's going to give you this whole chromosome. You now also are a copy number variant. Right? Um, and so there is there's been some experimentation done. This uh, in particular is looking at breast cancer. And so in this study they took cells from breast cancer and then they took normal breast cells and isolated them and then fluorescently tagged them. Once they did that, they isolated the metaphase chromosomes from each of them and um, dyed them so they had a particular staining pattern and looked at them. So what they were able to see, these are the results, this is just sort of an example, so um, when certain, so if there was a one-to-one -one ratio between the breast cancer genes and the normal genes, it means that they had basically the same number of copies of particular genes, right? So this is a chromosome. In this part of the chromosome, they had an equal number of the genes. Over here, towards this end, there was copy number variation, and so in some of the cells, and I can't remember if this is uh, green to red, so this would be, I believe this is the breast cancer, would show a duplication of right here. Here there is a deletion in one of them, a deletion, 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 right? So they look at the ratio of genes in cancer cells versus normal cells and see if there was a distinct copy number variant. <coughs> okay, um, so this is a table from your book. You don't have to memorize it. Uh, I just wanted to point out some of the disorders that we know or some of the more common chromosomal abnormalities or structure variation that we see, and then some of the symptoms. So here's our cry to chat, which is a deletion on chromosome five, right? I said cranial features, cry, and then intellectual disabilities. Um, a lot of these, you'll notice, don't necessarily have syndromes associated with them, so we haven't named them. They may be fairly rare, but we do know that they happen. Um, and again, we know sort of the symptomatic pieces that go along with them. Okay, questions on duplications or deletions? We're good, inserting and deleting things. <laughs> yeah, so now we're, now we're flipping things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for duplication and, duplications and deletions, remind me what happens to total amount of genetic material in a cell. It changes. It, goes, it increases or decreases, right? So inversions and translocations, which are the next two pieces, we often see the amount of genetic material in a cell staying the same. So in this case, for an inversion, we are taking a section of DNA and flipping it backwards. So rather than running DEF after an inversion, it runs FED. So we take out a whole chunk, it accidentally gets flipped and inserted backwards. Generally, in inversions, we have very, very little phenotypic effect. We haven't made extra gene copies, we haven't deleted gene copies, we have the same exact genes present, 
they're just occurring in a different order. So most of the time in an inversion, the person who has the inversion is phenotypically normal. Okay, so if I have an inversion on my chromosomes, I'm phenotypically normal. We don't see, we wouldn't necessarily look for a, an underlying cause for anything because we don't have a symptom to start with. Um, these inversions can happen around the centromere or beyond the centromere. So in a pericentric inversion would be where we include the centromere in our flip, right? So here we have D, E, centromere, F, G. Down here we have G, F, centromere, E, D. Okay, so when this chromosome break broke, it broke on either side of the centromere and then flipped. Parocentric is going to be beyond the centromere. So in this case, um, here we have B, C, D, E in our normal chromosome. Down here we have E, D, C, B, and then the centromere. So the centromere is not involved in a parocentric inversion. Um, there are times when an inversion can cause a phenotypic change. If the break of the chromosome happens in the middle of a gene, that's going to cause a problem. Right? So if we broke this chromosome right in the middle of D, that means half of your functional gene is now here and half of it is over here. That's not going to work when we're transcribing and translating. We can't transcribe something that's not continuous. Okay, so that disrupts gene function. Um, we can also have phenotypic changes and in inversions if um, the location of the gene is, how should I say this, if in your gen bio courses, did you go into like regulators and operons and Promoters. Okay, so you know that a gene codes for a protein, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are sometimes factors outside of the genes that tell parts of the cell whether or not they should actually copy that gene. So they're not part of the actual gene sequence, they're on either side of it. When we flip that around, sometimes they are too far away now to actually signal for proper gene translation or transcription. So when we sort of break up these units that should be a certain distance from each other, that can also change how a gene is transcribed or translated. Okay, so little phenotypic, little phenotypic effect normally, but there are a couple instances where we may see changes in a gene expression as a result of it. So I'm not going to be clear. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about the this is an example between two species where we have evidence of an inversion taking place. So humans and chimpanzees are fairly similar. We have very similar number of chromosomes, we have very similar chromosome structure. Chromosome 4 in the human and the chimpanzee, very similar, right? We see, if we look at these, they look to be about the same size. The centromere is kind of in the same-ish location. The, the gene banding patterns are very similar. A big difference that has been identified is that there has been an inversion in one of these. Right? So this was uh, maybe the more ancestral, ancestral chromosome. There was a break on either side of the centromere, and it was flipped in the humans. So this, this is between species, not within species, but still evidence of an inversion taking place. Like I said this. <laughs> um, the last point on this slide that I haven't mentioned yet is that um, usually an individual who has an inversion is phenotypically normal. So like I mentioned, you know, maybe I have an inversion in one of my chromosomes. I would be a phenotypically normal human. Um, when I go to reproduce though, inversions can have a major effect on gamete formation. So I'm normal, phenotypically, from a genetic standpoint. We'll argue the rest of that. Um, but my offspring may not be because of this inversion. So I'm going to show you what it looks like when we have inversions during meiosis. I'm 
not going to ask you to memorize or draw these out, but I want you to be able to see why a gamete may be abnormal. Okay, so when we line up our tetrads during meiosis, we oftentimes have crossing over between those inner two. Yes? Okay, if we have an inversion, our genes now do not line up properly. So if we are going to have crossing over, the genes are going to need to line up in a way that makes the sequences very similar. So there are two panels here. One is showing uh, pericentric and one is showing paracentric. So this is pericentric and this is pericentric um, inversions. During meiosis, in order for crossing over to occur, these chromosomes have to form inversion loops. Okay, so if we look at what's going on here, this chromosome is trying to cross over with whoops, this chromosome, but since their genes are in the opposite order, they have to basically form a weird ball, like tie themselves up, and line C, D, and E up, right? Because C, D, and E are in a different order on this homologous chromosome, down here they're E, Ds. Okay, so in order for them to line up and cross over, they have to loop. When they loop, the results look like this. Okay. The big issue here is that when these all separate out, we're going to get a normal chromosome here, although it does have an inversion, a normal chromosome here. This one, it's not going to work. Okay. This, one. Oh. this one, what's going to be wrong with this chromosome? It has two centromeres for a starter, and it has A, B, C, D, E, B, A. That's a weird combination of genes. It's missing some and has extras of others. This one, so this gamete is going to get, one gamete is going to get that. It has no centromeres, so it will not even end up back in a nucleus. This piece actually uh, degrades. It's kind of funky. And even if it did, we have, what, G, F, E, D, C, F, G, okay? So in this individual, we end up with 50% normal gametes, so this one's normal and this one's normal, but these two, it's anybody's guess what actually ends up in a cell or how it ends up looking, okay? Because it could be one long chromosome with two centromeres, here they've shown it broken into two very short chromosomes, both of them missing major segments. This one over here, <coughs> excuse me, where the centromere is involved, again, we're going to have to do a funky loop. The loop looks a little bit different this time. Um, our offspring end up looking different. Everybody's the right length, but we do end up with two normal again because those the outside chromosomes don't go through crossing over. Um, but then we end up with two that don't have the right chromosomal composition at all. Okay, so two probably non-viable and two viable. So this demonstrates why an individual who's phenotypically normal sometimes has infertility issues or has difficulties reproducing or often produces gametes that are genetically um, different than they should be if they have an inversion. If only 50% of your gametes are viable Usually that's going to become apparent if you're trying to have it. <coughs> All right, so um, I'm just going to tell you what transmutations are now, and then I want to give a little bit of time to answer questions on the worksheet. So um, a translocation is going to be changes or switching genetic material between two non-homologous chromosomes. So instead of dealing with chromosome 1 only, we're dealing with chromosome 1 and 2. This is an example of a reciprocal translocation because our two chromosomes have exchanged an equal amount of genetic material. Right? So a section of chromosome 1 broke off and a section of chromosome 2 broke off and they flipped that material. That would be reciprocal? That would be reciprocal, yes. Some images of non-reciprocal translocations. 
So a non-reciprocal translocation, not showing on here either. I'm going to come back to these. I'm going to come back. Um, so this would be, uh, yes. I will add in an image of a non-reciprocal translocation. But it would be if piece of chromosome 1 broke off, so let's say ENF broke off here, and just stuck on the end of chromosome 2. So this one would be MNOPQRSFG. And that one would be A, B, C, D. Okay, so again, with translocations, we're not changing the amount of genetic material. We're just changing where that genetic material is found. Okay, so we will wrap up um, translocations on Monday, and then we'll talk about basically errors in meiosis and how we get too many or too few entire chromosomes in a daughter cell. <coughs> Uh, I will let you, so let me ask this first of all, is, are there any questions on the homework that people would like me to go over as a whole class? Yes, okay, that's what I was expecting to hear. Okay, so number five was intended to make you think, so it's okay. <laughs> I'm going to uh, walk you through it by going through meiosis in these cells, okay? So, for number five, part A, I know in the description it says that we have an X-linked gene. At this point, I'm just going to assume that there are two genes on two autosomes. It doesn't matter if it's on an X chromosome or not for this example. So what I give you is I say we have a female who is this. Right? And I say we're going to test cross this one. So what does our male look like? Okay. Yes? Okay. This is an excellent example of why we use homozygote recessive individuals for a test cross. If there is recombination, in this male, so we have crossing over occurring, what do his resultant gametes look like? <laughs> they look exactly the same, and they're all recessive. So we can tell exactly which pieces the male is Okay, That's why we use test crosses to do this. Um, I'll also remind people, so this is chromosomal notation. If it makes more sense to you, you can add another chromosome here. <coughs> So these would be homologous chromosomes, right? And this one has wild type alleles, and this one has recessive alleles. Okay. So what we want to know is what will the offspring of these individuals look like? One way that we can do it is we can say, well, we know that our R and N genes are linked. So the first thing we want to do is figure out what the parental offspring would look like. And all we would do for that is we would say, well, they're going to inherit this entire chromosome from mom. And then we know what the chromosome that they get from dad looks like. Yes? Okay, the other option for our parentals is we can get that whole chromosome from mom. And again, we know exactly what we get from dad. So they're that. Phenotypically, all wild type, all recessive. Is everybody still with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Now, the next piece we have to add into this is the independently assorting F gene. And I think that this is where people are getting a little bit lost. This is just going through meiosis. So what are our options for mom? Wild type. Okay, so we can get wild type or recessive, and we can get those with either of these. So if you inherited wild type from mom, we know again that you get that from dad, so you could be this. The other option is that you would still have your linked wild type R and N, but you could inherit the recessive from mom. 
And the same thing here, we could get a wild type fork tooth, non fork tooth for mom, or Again, these are linked, so we don't change those. You can get the recessive fork tooth for mom. Okay? These are all parental options. Is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing that I gave you is that 30% or 30 math units here. The 30 map units tells us that 70% of our offspring are going to be parental. So out of 100, 70 of them will be one of these. All we do to figure out what each phenotypic group, or how much, how many of each phenotypic group we get, we divide this by four. So this one. So that if you need to visualize this in a different way, we have that option as well. Alright, so we are starting, we'll start with mom. So this is going to be mom's germ cell. In this germ cell, she's going to make some gametes. So she has one copy of the chromosome that has R plus and N plus. She has a homologous chromosome where she has R and N. And then she also has another chromosome that has F and oh, what the heck, seven? recombination is happening here. So this would this is what it looks like before recombination. I'm going to erase and draw it as if recombination occurred. So now we have R plus and N still linked on one chromosome. Those are our parentals. We have R and N plus, and then we have R plus and N. So when this cell divides, we are going to get F plus and F still doing their things. We are also going to get our recombinant chromosomes. Chromatid and this chromatid are where we have our recombinants. 
R plus and N, R and N plus are not found in our current holds. Okay. So when we're making the gametes down here, I'm going to make our four gametes up here. So from this cell, we're going to end up with an R plus and an N, and then an F plus, which we've already done over there. We're also going to end up with an R and an N plus and an F plus, which is not one that we've written on that side. We would then have R and N and little f, and also R plus and N and little f. Okay. So this is four phenotypic groups. This would be one of your recombinants. This would be the other recombinant. If you wanted to do this again to get the others, you would flip these two. And then that would give you this with F and this with F plus. So this is two sort of different ways to look at the same thing. For those of you who need to see or like to see the whole, thing, like we're going back to meiosis, we're making gametes, fertilization occurs, and fertilization is how we get those end zygotes that have two copies of each chromosome. I don't care which one of these makes more sense to you. This is the actual process that happens. This is the end result.
Do you want anything? No. I have coffee. 